and hopefully this is recording. And we are. So what I've got for tomorrow is 25 multiple choice questions. Um, there were six on demand, three on price floors, price ceilings, and that type of thing. One producer surplus, six shifting supply, demand, or shifting both of them together. Two movement along the lines, changing quantity demand, changing quantity supply. Two on equilibrium or shortages or surpluses. Um, one on supply, two on taxes, and two on the world price. So that's 25 questions, multiple choice. Then there's going to be seven graphs. Um, one is a movement along the line. Four are single shifters, and then two are double shifters, going from E1 to E2 to E3. Um, really don't think anything is that difficult, but my basic idea is just if you have any questions, specific questions, um, go ahead and start with your question. So it looks like Miko. Um, go ahead and ask your first question. Yeah, I had a question about how price floors and price ceilings relate to the government action shifter. So if a government puts in place a price floor or a price ceiling, does that count as government action for the shifter on supply? No. All right. Government action would be a subsidy, would be taxes, um, and those are government action. All right. Next question. Nothing. This is short. I've got 45 minutes on this thing that it'll record. We're done. Are we going to have any double shift problems? Uh, we will have two that you have to draw. And then there will be, I think, two on the multiple choice. So that's basically your answer on double shifters. So just basically go with what shifts first, whether it's demand or supply, make the shift, make the increase or decrease, and then do the next one. Do it logically. Um, if it's an increase, it shifts to the right. If it's a decrease, it shifts to the left. Um, put your equilibrium points and just logically go to the spot. And then when you go to the last part, you'll see what happens, whether you know whether the price has gone up or down for sure or whether quantity is going up or down for sure, and then you'll know what it is. But if you logically do it, it'll work out. Um, can we go over an example of world price? Sure. Um, it, it's it's going to be a multiple choice question. So um, if you have domestic trade by yourself, and all you have is you're trading and you're buying and selling. When you have world, a world price and you increase the world in both examples, whether we were importing country or an exporting country, surplus increased. So your total surplus when you have world trade will increase. And that's basically the idea of trade is trade's going to give you more things, more products, more innovation, and in many cases at a lower price, especially for the importing country, you can actually see it, it's a lower price. Um, but in general, you're gonna get more surplus, which is what you want. Um, so that's that question. Um, let's see. And let me know if you need more on that question, if you need anything like that. Um, dead weight questions. Um, that is basically a question in the taxes. Um, what is the effect of a tax on, uh, in the graphing and you're reducing producer surplus and consumer surplus and that dead weight loss is a reduction of efficiency. So not specifically a dead weight loss question, kind of like indirect, but, um, no, it wouldn't be in that. Um, what makes something more elastic or inelastic? Um, in demand, in supply, they're both separate. So in demand, what makes something um, elastic is that it's a luxury. 
and that there are substitutes and it's a larger price. So an inelastic product would be one that's a necessity. It's a small price to income and there are no substitutes. So normally for necessities, I look at gasoline, I look at um, tissue paper, toilet paper, toothpaste, um, and then we did talk about alcohol, cigarettes, to those people that are using it, they are necessities. Um, and then elastic is something that is a luxury and there are lots of substitutes. Now on the supply side, um, it's all based on overhead and costs. So if it's something that's easy to make, if something that um, e there's low overhead, something that you can make in market day, that is elastic. And then if it's inelastic, there's lots of overhead, there's lots of automation, big plant and equipment. So that makes something more elastic or inelastic. And that is a question directly, or that's an answer on that tax problem. Um, consumer surplus, producer surplus one. Um, and it's about producer surplus and where the area is under the graph. Um, and, or what it, what it just basically says, what is producer surplus? And that's the answer there. Um, how to identify excise taxes in a graph? Um, not really sure, Kyle, what your question is, um, but you're basically shifting the graph based on the tax. You're either shifting demand or you're shifting supply based on if you're taxing buyers or sellers. Um, and you're making, um, you're reducing surplus, reducing producer surplus and consumer surplus and you have that dead weight loss, but we will not be graphing that in any of the things. So we okay. won't be graphing that. Okay. Uh, there will not be a price floor, price ceiling graph. Um, there'll be three questions on price floors and price ceilings, but it's mostly the shifting that you're gonna be uh, graphing. So like I said, there's gonna be seven graphs. What else we got? What questions do you have? Mr. Try to mute the sound, and if you have a question, put it in the chat, and then I'll go ahead and answer it. What do we got? Import quotas. Um, there is... No question on it. It's mostly world trade and what we get from trade. So I, I will say that, that'll be in unit five more. So not on this one. So this is just a brief part on it. So nothing with import quotas. Taxes are the multiple choice questions. Correct. The graphing is shifting. And like I said before, it's one with movement along the line four of single shifters and two double shifters. And that's the only graphs that you can have. And then the 25 multiple choice. Um, explanation on price floors. Um, a price floor is always, if it's to be binding and effective, it's above equilibrium. A price floor causes surpluses. And a price floor keeps something from equilibrium. And it normally, an example would be uh, farm supports, giving money to farmers. Um, minimum wage is an example of a price floor. Um, and it causes a surplus of workers. Um, and when we do price supports for farming, we have a surplus of wheat and corn and whatever is there because they produce more than is actually needed. They do cre increase the price. They do cause disequilibrium where there's less demand and there's more supply. Um, does that help, Dylan? Didn't say anything about an equilibrium problem. I said equilibrium is on the test. So it's a multiple choice question like surplus and uh, shortage and equilibrium. Those are equilibrium questions per se. Um, Jennifer, I, you, you're going to have to ask a specific question about a graph. 
Um, this is not really the place to draw and do things like that, but ask a question, I'll be happy to answer. Quantities do not have to be in the thousands, they just have to be listed, and they have to be hundreds or millions or wherever you put. But when I ask people to draw a graph, just make sure you label all the parts. Let's see. Dylan, what did you catch? And you can talk. What did you catch on this or what did you miss? What is the most important thing to study for the test? Supply and demand. Um, shifters, I mean, like I said, it's, it's pretty much, you'll have the law of demand, you'll have the law of supply, you'll have shifters, you'll have, it's, it's application, application questions. Um, no, I did not, I removed elastic and inelastic from your study guide, from your homework. The only thing that you have to know about elastic or inelastic is how it relates to the tax. And that's it. So I cut it out, except for just had to mention that for, that's how, who, who pays the most in the tax. Is whoever is most inelastic pays the tax. Um, Alana, the most questions are shifters. So that could be your answer, but you know, it's the best I can do. What else we got? What other questions? It's pretty easy. Nothing else? Jennifer, did you have a question on the graph? What's your specific question? So I did have a question, but it's kind of hard to like explain right. it to you. So I drew like a little, yeah. Do you see it? Should I zoom in? Do you see? Be, kind of, what's your question? So basically, I looked on your PowerPoint and this is point A and this is point C. So how is this from point A to point C considered a change in demand? Like what is the reasoning behind it? Well, the graph, you can get, that PowerPoint was saying you can get to that quantity two different ways. You can go to point A and B, or you could go to A and C. And that C and B are the same quantity. So a change in demand is shifting the demand curve or shifting the supply curve. That's a change. Uh, the shifters, the five shifters, income, yeah. um, population, tastes and preferences, future expectations, um, those things shift the demand curve over and at every price, the quantity increases. So the point of that graph is you can get to that quantity, um, either C or B are the same quantity, um, and you can get it by moving down the line by a change in price, or you can get there by a shift in demand. And a change in demand to increase or decrease demand, you have to have one of those shifters. And that's what a lot of people get confused on. It's those shifters and only those shifters move the demand curve or move the supply curve. And again, if I say income tax, that is only supply. That is not demand. Okay. Does um, that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I have another question. Go ahead. Okay, so you know, um, I think you explained this already, but then I forgot. So basically, E one is where the e equilibrium is, and then what is, and then what is E two? What does that point mean? That would be the second equilibrium after you shift. Oh, and E three depends the, on the second shift, and that's the new equilibrium. And you okay. can shift again and have E four, and you can shift again and have E five. Okay. So every time you every time you shift one of the supplier demand, you're gonna have a new equilibrium. Okay, so for example, um, 
one of the problems is like a change in demand first and then a change in um, supply second. So would you put E3 on the They're on line? both. They're on both. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's where they intersect on both. And you'll have both shifters. You don't, have, you don't assume demand is first. It could be uh, supply first. So don't assume which goes first. Read the question and do that. Uh, 25 multiple choice questions, seven graphs. How do you calculate revenue? It's the tax times the quantity. So however, whatever the tax is, $2, and then the quantity that is sold at $2, so that's two times 10 and that's 20. So it's real easy with the tax revenue or the calculate the revenue there. Um, if we have a price floor below the point of equilibrium, will our price goes towards the original point? Um, if you have a price floor below equilibrium, you will stay at equilibrium. So you're going to stay at equilibrium and that's where you're going to be. The price floor is useless. So it's meaningless, has nothing to do with anything. Um, on your homework, most people just, you know, just do the shifters. Practice the shifters, go in the right direction and just Remember, an increase is to the right, a decrease is to the left. And then look at what happens to price and quantity. Uh, answer the question, because I'm asking you the question, what happens to price, what happens to quantity? Um, and I asked for quantity supply and quantity demanded. Look at your graph and look at those. One of our practice problems said, price falls from $3 to $1 for burger. Equilibrium starts at three, so equilibrium is three. That should be drawn on there. And then you need to decrease and go down to two. And then you now have disequilibrium. You do need to draw equilibrium on the graph. You do need to do that. These are all supply and demand together. Let's see. Okay. So um, how's this, uh, is everyone right now on audio? I feel like it's only shifting to me. Nobody, I hear you. Everybody can hear. Okay. I'm the one that's talking. I asked everybody to go to mute. You did. I did. I asked everybody in the beginning to go to mute so we can ask <laughs> questions. Okay. I'm just, just listening right now. So put your question in the chat room and then we can go from there. Okay. Skylar, what's your question about world trade and world price? What do you want explained? I'm not sure. So go ahead and put the sound on and ask. Um, I don't really have like a general question. It's just I'm looking at one of the graphs that we did in our notes and it's under like the import quota section and I know that you were talking about it earlier and I just like, I just kind of want to know what we need to know for that. Know the graph, know yeah. where you started, like your producer surplus and your consumer surplus to begin. Okay. And then what happens to surplus and know whether producer surplus goes up or down, consumer surplus goes up or down. What happens to the price? Is it lower or higher? You know, is quantity increasing or decreasing? There won't be an export price. It'll just be the uh, import question. And then overall, what does trade do? I mean, we've talked about it multiple times. Trade, you know, increases quantity. It lowers prices. It gives us more things. Um, so there's only two questions on world trade. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gretchen, it depends on the problem. I might say demand first, and then I might say supply first. The multiple choice questions will be the same way. It'll just tell you, and you just answer specifically the question. But there is no rule, or there is no nothing, so just look at it. But demand can shift first, and so can supply.
so I guess we have a question. Alana, you're asking about substitutes or are you asking about uh, compliments? What's your question? Uh, so I was thinking about the problem on our homework that was like about the milk and how the price in milk went up um, and how does that shift cereal? And I like just don't, I don't know that. So that was my question, I guess. Okay. So is it is milk and cereal a, cere a compliment or a substitute? Uh, compliment. Correct. So you need one to have the other, basically. So if the price of milk goes up, there you go, the quantity demanded of milk decreases. Okay. Price goes up, quantity demanded decreases, and then the demand for cereal would decrease. It would shift to the left. Okay. They kind of go together with this one. So like if you have a substitute, um, if the price of, say, Pop-Tarts goes down, people are gonna buy more Pop-Tarts, so then the demand for cereal decreases and goes to the left. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Skylar, I would say yes, um, if you're just asked to number things, and you will be, I mean, I'm gonna give you equilibrium, and then the rest you can make up and I really don't care. And like even on the, 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 get, the uh, graph questions, I'm asking what happened to price? Did it go up or down? Did it increase or decrease? What happened to quantity supplied and quantity demanded? And most of quantity supplied and quantity demanded both increase. The only time it doesn't is when the price of the product goes up and you're moving along in opposite directions. Um, you can give me real numbers or you can make up the numbers. That's fine. Um, but in general, unless you're given a demand schedule and supply schedule, you can make those numbers up. And that's fine. Oh, wait. So and with that, when you give us equilibrium and then you're asking us like with a shifter, um, do we like if you say like price increases, would you give numerical values or just say that it increases? Like, you know what I mean? You can do either one. Okay. Jennifer, I would say yes. At least put my values on there and add a little bit to help you out for the values on the graph. What do you mean, Natalie? Are we going to do things with the taxes? You have two tax questions on multiple choice. So there's not going to be any graph. It's just asking, again, like I told you, um, what does taxes do? to efficiency, and if you tax the producer and the consumer, does it matter? And then um, who pays the tax? Those are the basic three main questions that I wanna get you out of the tax problem. Does that make sense, Natalie, or do you have another question? Go ahead and ask if you have it, it's okay? All right. Miko, what's your question? Uh, my question is about, in class we talked about, or we graphed how taxes affect um, consumers and producers proportionally. And if I remember the main outcome from that was, it doesn't matter if you tax consumers or producers, consumers tend to pay more of a larger percent of the taxes. Is that correct? No. No, okay. The, the, the point basically is is i can put a two dollar tax on producers and i can put a two dollar tax on consumers the result is identical so it doesn't matter who you tax my point might be i might want to tax the producers and have them pay all of it all of the two dollars but it's never going to happen and the result is it doesn't matter Right. Now, who pays the tax is who is more inelastic. That is who pays the tax. So, because inelastic means they must buy it or they must produce it, they can't get away from it. It doesn't change. It's a very steep graph or steep curve. And they, like in gasoline, if you're a consumer in gasoline, the, the basic idea is you're going to pay the tax. Now, unless producers are steeper. So whoever is steeper, whoever's more inelastic, pays the tax. 
and right. it's not it's not who's first it's not who's second um it's who more who's more inelastic all right thank you um did i answer your question kyle or do you need me to go a little bit more no it makes sense does it make sense that if somebody has to buy it and they can't switch over to something else and there's no substitute I mean, it's like if we taxed anything at market day, nobody will buy it because they'll buy something else. But if you tax something that's a necessity, they have to buy that and they're going to pay the tax. So in our examples, it wasn't 50-50. It was the buyer paid, you know, 75% and the seller paid 25% or vice versa. Um, good question, Jennifer. Um, I use... The question, um, one question that's on multiple choice is why is the demand curve downward sloping? And it's because of the substitution effect because people could buy something else and um, also the income effect. So there's a question on why is the, is the demand curve downward sloping? And you need to know the three reasons. The third is the law of diminishing marginal utility. Um, now, basically, if um, I'm not really sure the second part, of, I mean, what is your question that I need to know? So please uh, ask it again and let me know. So um, back to what you said. So when you said the demand curve is always sloping. I mean, sloping Slope, downwards. Downward sloping, correct. Yeah. So, Inverse relationship. So should we put like all of the above, or is one more one answer more right than the other? Well, it's it's you're gonna have to look at the question, um, and you're gonna have to look at it and determine what is the right answer because I I might only have one of them. I might put the law of supply. I might put uh, the definition of demand and then the income effect. So you're going to have to look at the question, but in the test, I have one.